Great, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you to everyone that's joining us. Um, this is an event hosted or co-hosted by um, the Pathfinders Programme at the Centre on International Cooperation in NYU uh, with ITUC and, and the Women in Informal Employment Globalising and Organising at the WeGo Group. I'm Faiza Shaheen. I'm the lead on inequality and exclusion uh, at, at uh, the Pathfinders Programme, working on a big grand challenge programme. For those of you that don't know us, we're a multi-staker po partnership um, aiming to really create uh, and look at the solutions to inequality and exclusion uh, linked to uh, building a peaceful, just uh, and inclusive society. When we were thinking about what we wanted to do in CSW um, and looking at where the gaps might be within some of the discussions, the care sector was the first one that really stood out to me. Um, care for our sick and elderly, for our children, for each other, has been at the heart of humanity and certainly at the heart of the COVID resilience in the last year. Yet this work is overwhelming. Um, which is all this work, which is overwhelmingly uh, performed by women in migrant labor, is very often low paid um, it, or unpaid, um, unrecognized, um, and unvalued. Um, and this really struck me some years ago. I was doing some work looking at jobs for people without graduate degrees, and the care sector being one of the big ones alongside uh, sectors like construction and logistics. And when I looked at the pay for each of those sectors, it was very noticeable that the care sector was paid a lot less than construction on logistics. And when I looked across at the gender balance uh, in those sectors, I couldn't help but think to myself, uh, is this anything to do with the fact that this is overwhelmingly women in the care sector and that care is seen as women's work, that it's so low paid? Um, and since then, and been very aware that the economy works in quite sexist ways um, in terms of who gets paid what. But look, the care sector is a big employer and it's only gonna grow as an employer. Changes to family structures and an aging society point to a coming care crisis. Um, and of course, COVID-19 has exposed how vulnerable carers are to ill health and poverty. And in so many countries we're unable to take sick leave um, because they didn't have proper provisions. And when they went into work, um, then uh, meant that they could sometimes give COVID to elderly people who of course were one of the most vulnerable uh, populations. It's a reminder again of how connected we are and how much we need to look after our carers, care for our carers um, in order to care for the people they look after as well. So today we wanted to really get to how we move forward from this point. I think for so many of us, it's been frustrating to see uh, people out clapping and governments talk about the importance of care workers as essential workers. And yet for the most part, when you look across the world, there hasn't been any real change in terms of how much care workers are paid or the security of their contracts. Um, so today we really wanna look at what we do moving forward from this point. Um, the care sector and doing something about care work is very much an economic issue, but it is also a gender rights issue as well. So to start off and to kick us off, very, very happy to have uh, Chidi King here, who is the director of the Equality Department at ITUC, who will speak about this path that will make us more inclusive, accessible and resilient um, going forward. Thank you, Chidi. Thank you so much, Faiza. It's a real pleasure to be part um, of this panel, a very important um, and vital panel, um, particularly in the midst of the current situation, the pandemic that we're all trying to navigate. Um, as you mentioned, um, the care sector comprises a really broad and diverse work workforce, which includes, of course, doctors, surgeons, nurses, nursing assistants and aides, childcare workers, domestic workers, aged care workers, carers of people with special needs, including people with physical and learning disabilities, people navigating mental health difficulties and many more. And I think it's really important to just set out from the outset just how broad and wide this sector is. And of course, as you mentioned, it's also um, a sector 
that is overwhelmingly female, 70% of the world's um, care and health workforce um, are women. But women um, within, this within these sectors are most um, commonly found in the lower um, end, if I can put it that way, of the sector. So in the more precarious jobs, the lower paid jobs, the jobs with um, little or less um, attention to health and safety, as we saw um, critically um, during this pandemic and experience, um, as, you, as you said, um, quite a significant um, gender pay gap um, that has again been further exposed as a result of the pandemic. And as you mentioned, it's essential to our humanity. We can't survive, let alone thrive, without paid and unpaid um, care work. And yet the recognition um, that this work receives, um, the value that is attached to this work, whether it's paid or unpaid, is so little. Um, you would have thought that a global health pandemic would change um, you know, the view or the perception, particularly amongst those who have the power to effect change, um, but we're, we're still to see this percolating um, back down. I would argue that um, you know, the, the issue of care is not only uh, uh, an issue that is um, firmly rooted in gender equality, um, without proper recognition and investment in care, we will never achieve um, gender equality because of all the social norms that still surround um, the provision of care. But it's also very much a class issue and an and a issue of race. If we look at our care workforces um, across the world, again, yes, over, overwhelmingly um, female, but also in many parts of the world, overwhelmingly migrant, um, overwhelmingly women of color, um, overwhelmingly black women. And again, to be low paid, precarious, unprotected um, sectors of the care um, and health workforce. Um, even before this global um, pandemic, there was a global shortage of health workers. And um, the WHO has said, um, in particular, um, nurses and midwives, again, majoritarily um, women, um, make up more than 50% of this um, global shortage. And that um, we need an additional 9 million nurses and midwives if we're going to ever attain um, the um, goal of um, health and well being, which is encapsulated in goal three of the sustainable um, development goals. So we need um, for governments to start paying attention to investing um, in the global health and care workforce to ensure that we have a well-trained, well-educated, well-regulated and well-supported health and care uh, workforce that is paid according to the true value um, of its work and who receive you know, the recognition that they deserve not, not only through applause, and cheering, but also through attention to the working conditions and the pay that they receive. We also know that unpaid care work subsidizes the global economy. Um, if we were to invest um, in, or if we were to count rather, the um, amount that the, the unpaid care work of women contributes to the gross domestic product of most countries, it runs into literally trillions um, of dollars. And yet we don't see this reflected in national accounting systems. It is largely invisible. And of course, the pandemic has just increased and exacerbated the load of unpaid care that, again, majoritarily um, women um, in our societies um, shoulder, women and girls, I have to say, because in many parts of the world, it is also girls who are taking up the slack where the state um, fails to, to provide um, care services. So we know that even before COVID-19, women were performing, um, let's say three quarters of all um, unpaid care work, which impacts negatively um, on our ability to access full-time productive and decent work, to remain in and advance in, in work, and that the pandemic has further exacerbated and deepened pre-existing inequalities around gender, class, and, and racial lines, for example. We know also that um, as a result of measures that have been taken to contain the spread of the virus, and women are now um, shouldering an increased um, share of childcare responsibilities and care for the elderly, um, infirmed um, and disabled. Um, so in addition to job losses that we've seen in female dominated sectors who have been affected by these measures, you can think for example of um, you know, tourism, um, retail sectors, um, et cetera. Um, 
we know that the additional responsibility of shouldering um, childcare and other um, forms of care is contributing to the withdrawal of women from the labor market in significant numbers. So in the USA alone, you know that 865,000 women dropped out of the labor market just in September 2020, compared with 216,000 men. And the majority of those women dropping out of um, the workforce cited um, lack of childcare as the reason. And we know that the crisis has also increased the psychosocial risks and you know, the, the, the threat to mental health um, as well as physical well-being, um, especially for, for women um, with, um, with young children. I think it's mentioned before, um, you know, the, the, the global health care and social care workforce is also um, strongly composed of, of migrant women, more than 80% of the world's nurses, for instance, work in countries um, that are not their country um, of, orange, of origin. And we're seeing now a global scramble for health workers um, with bilateral labor and migration agreements being concluded um, between high income and low income countries, which of course will result in further depletion of a much needed healthcare workforce in countries that already bear the brunt of the world's disease um, burden, COVID-19 um, notwithstanding. Again, at the start of um, the pandemic and indeed throughout the pandemic, we've seen um, the role that um, gender inequalities within the health and care workforce plays in terms of the well-being um, of those workers and their ability to keep safe, um, their ability to protect themselves or to be protected indeed by their employers. So right at the beginning, we had this um, shortage of personal protective equipment which particularly, again, affected um, those who were um, in, you know, let's say less powerful positions and less able perhaps to advocate um, for their rights um, in the workplace, where the role of unions, of course, comes in um, extremely important. It, it, it comes in um, very importantly. Um, if we look at um, what happened in the, in social care settings in many parts of the world and the way that COVID-19 spread throughout these settings. Again, some of the reasons behind that relate to um, the working conditions. Again, a highly precarious workforce in many instances. Um, in many instances, also still quite an unorganized um, workforce. Um, and again, you know, um, a, a workforce which um, perhaps does not enjoy um, access to uh, measures such as um, sick leave, as you mentioned behind, so social protection that might enable them um, to protect themselves um, from, the, from the pandemic. I think in fact, Uni Global Union, um, a global union federation recently report, uh, re released a report which showed that um, long-term care was one of the deadliest sectors um, to be working in. Um, you know, it was dangerous before the pandemic, but the pandemic made that even more dangerous with workers um, being asked to go into work, even when they reported feeling unwell or you know, be reported suspecting um, that they had um, symptoms of COVID. So this is a, um, you know, a, a workforce, again, as we've said, is absolutely essential and central to our humanity, and yet is not um, receiving um, the recognition and attention that it deserves. A cursory look at spending plans for the recovery shows that many, if not most, most governments are focusing on areas such as physical infrastructure and military spending. So there seems to be little reflection in government spending plans of the applause and gratitude um, that we've seen for our health workers um, during this pandemic. That needs to change. It changes by recognizing, um, first of all, that investing um, in care is just that, it's an investment. It's not just an expenditure. And um, you know, too many um, governments seem to view this still as just a cost, a cost to the public purse, rather than an investment in our societies, investment in our economies, I mean, an investment that yields long-term gains. Because when you're also investing in, uh, you know, in, in care and health, including early childhood education, you're, res you're investing in more resilient um, populations. So you're also investing in the ability to face further economic shocks and face further pandemics, because as we're all hearing, this certainly will not be the last um, global pandemic um, that the world um, experiences. 
um, from the ITC perspective and um, with, um, along with the Women's Budget Group who prepared a report for us, we commissioned a report um, quite a while back, I think back in 2016 and another one in 2017, that showed just a 2% um, increase in GDP or 2% investment of GDP um, in, in care services could yield uh, millions of jobs and improve or advance gender equalities. It could eradicate or at least help to eradicate some of the inequalities that are so deeply entrenched um, in our labor markets. Um, the ILO has also um, produced statistics of the um, returns that come from investing in care, the social returns, but also the economic returns, the multiplier effects that are produced by investing in care. Because when you liberate um, people from um, performing a large amount of um, care duties, they're then free to take up employment in other sectors, um, not just the care sector, but other sectors of the labor market. So it is an investment and it's an investment that's needed um, now. That if a global pandemic doesn't point the way to the necessity of that investment, we all have to ask, well, what would, what would? Um, so I think I'll, I'll end there because I think I have just um, 10 minutes um, in the introductory remarks. But I'll end by saying again that message that you know now is the time for investment in care. It is. It makes sense all around. It makes sense in terms of you know um, addressing inequalities. It makes sense in terms of the well-being of populations. It makes sense in terms of our um, economies, and for the health and care um, workforce, um, it's about. It's really high time. It's past time, in fact, that we really did recognize and value um, the work that they do. Thank you, Chidi, for that overview. I mean, it is very frustrating when you lay out the arguments and, you know, every time I always think this is a real win-win, what is what is really blocking this? Um, and I'll come back to you with that question um, a little bit uh, later. And also, I guess what I'd really like every one of our speakers to think about is, is there anywhere that is getting this right or at least moving in the right direction? Are there any examples that we can look to that we can learn from? It's really important in the work that we do um, at Pathfinders to put forward some of the solutions. So I'll come back and pick on you again on that. Thank you, Chidi. So we're gonna move now to looking at a regional case study in Latin America. Um, and we're very lucky to have uh, Maria Licia Scuro join us as a social affairs officer in the Division for Gender Affairs at the Economic Commission for Latin America, Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you, Licia. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. We are very glad to share this morning this event with you and uh, thank you very much, TD, for uh, talk about these important issues. Maybe I can um, present and share with you the figures for Latin America and the face that is taking this crisis for the women in Latin America and the Caribbean with the, exactly the diagnosis that you mentioned and you introduced for all of us. So let me share with you a presentation that um, I have to say sorry because a few of the figures are still in Spanish, but I will resend to you the whole English, English version. And let me put presentation mode now, okay. So what do you mean by care economy? We are including all unpaid um, and paid work. So all the services and goods that we provide, we produce in order to um, the well-being of the members of the family, the community, the society. So we, we have this, this diagram, this figure that we really like because is all that <laughs> includes the, the care economy with different sectors of sub subsectors. And if you see the, the, the lila pink uh, part, we have the pay work with of course a salary, but a very heterogeneous pay and quality of work with labor rights in few countries, but still um, very um, um, 
in a stable sector and uh, occupational recognition like health or education. In, 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 the, in the other side, we have this paid domestic work that for us is, is the link between the market and the households where we have that T dimension, the paid domestic work in a very, um, in a very bad conditions for all the women, mainly in our region migrants that are employed in households with incipient labor regulation, with very low payments, with long working hours and very stressful working conditions and physical and emotional wear and tear. And uh, in, the, in the third part of the, of the diagram, we have this unpaid domestic and care work that uh, I can say that every woman uh, in the world in uh, part of her, her, their lives uh, do. And it's uninvisible, unpaid. We know that it's a very heavy workload in socioeconomical and deprived households mainly, and also physical and emotionally wear and tear. So um, we, can, we can see the care economy as this whole in, in different sectors, paid and unpaid work in the market or at the households. Uh, I think that also as uh, Chidi mentioned, we have this indicator that we agree with all the countries of uh, all the state members of United Nations in 2015, where we measure the time dedicated to, unpaid, uh, to the unpaid domestic and care work. And uh, we have very different methodologies, very different standard, very different surveys in the region, but we have a certainly trend. And that is uh, very important because, for example, no matter if the survey is like Mexico, that is an independent survey with a one hour uh, last interview, or a very small survey like Brazil with one or two questions, the trend is absolutely the same. The women spend one uh, part of the time at the labor market and two part of their time for the unpaid work and men invert or dedicate the inverse of this relation. So no matter <laughs> which survey we use on, or we methodology we choose, we have always this trend present in our region. So the three parts of the time that we work, total work, women dedicate two parts of it in uh, unpaid uh, domestic care, Domain, unpaid domestic or care uh, work, and men only one. We have this problem that, of course, you know that is in our region is in a demographic transition, and we choose few countries that are uh, increasing the proportion of uh, dependent population, mainly by the increase of the elderly people and the decrease of the proportion of people in the range of age of being potential caregivers. So for example, if you see women spend almost 20 hours uh, per week in the unpaid work. And also they are decreasing the proportion in the total population. So that is very important because uh, there are mm, mm, less people for care every time more dependent population. So that uh, we have to be present. We have this regional, the, the, the relation between the regional agenda with the global agenda. I, I, I will not stop here because I want to share with you this timeline with special um, milestones between the global and the regional agreements. 
we can uh, start, for example, in 1994 with our regional conference in Mar del Plata, where design the plan of action for the region. But I want to mention two, two more um, instances, uh, like the consensus, Quito consensus on 2007, where the ministers of the region agree about the importance of the care policies in the region. And I will jump to Santiago commitment that was very interest, interesting experience because in January of 2020, the minister, the government of the region agree about a contracyclic uh, economic policies in order to face the crisis. But we don't, we, in that uh, instant, we will don't know about the crisis that we, were, we will have in two months, two months later. So that uh, Santiago commitment was very, um, I don't know the exactly word in English, but was very uh, advanced or very visionary because of this commitment about pay special attention for the government um, with the, the impact of the crisis for uh, women. So, um, in March, March 2020, when the pandemic uh, installed in all over the world, we really uh, called off the ministry and all the governments again in order to say, we reaffirm, you reaffirm, you adapt this commitment. And in April, we have a very interesting meeting with the government about ratifying or adopting or confirming, reaffirming all that we agree in January and we start working with them in our observatory in order to monitoring all the measures uh, that the government were designing and implementing in order to face the crisis with gender perspective. Um, <coughs> as I mentioned, in our regional, gender regional agenda, um, four years ago, we, we, we determined this structural challenge of gender inequality, socioeconomic and inequality and poverty, sexual division of labor, patriarchal cultural patterns, and the concentration of powers. And we start work with the government in these four um, challenged, structural challenges for gender equality. And I have few 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 figures in order to re re reassure, reaffirmate what Titi was mentioned. Uh, the GPD in the region fall more than 7.7 percentual points, and the women's participation, the women's economic participation, fall uh, six percentual points. But the unemployment uh, rate for women rise up to 22.2 percent, and, and and that is very very um, concerning because we are talking about more than 10 years of regression in the progress in the advancement of women incorporating in labor market and economic uh, structure of our societies. So we have here a very, a very uh, important uh, point about how we will reactivate our economics, economies, putting or <laughs> rising, um, I don't want to say helping, but, but uh, supporting the reinsertion of women in labor in labor market. The uh, 23 million of women will will uh, will live in uh, poor um, households, and we have uh, pardon, sorry, uh, 23 more million. So we have. Uh, 118 million women living in poverty in in poverty households. So uh, we have this um, this figure that, as as she mentioned, we are have we have all um, almost 60 percent of women 
working in um, sectors that were very impact for the, the, the crisis like trade, like manufacture industry, like tourism, and also in the paid work that I want to share with you the figures for the countries that was one of the sector more affected for the crisis. For example, if you see the first country, Chile, uh, the employment at the paid work at households uh, decreased almost a half to 46.3%. Uh, and in Colombia, something similar uh, happened in the trimester May, July 2020, and so on with the countries that we have um, information available. So that is very important because our women in, in poverty or vul vulnerable to poverty and with uh, several difficulties to rejoin labor market because for example, there were there, there, there are migrants, they have not qualifications in order to achieve um, another kind of employment. And households are, uh, well, I don't know if you know, but in Latin America, we are uh, returning to lockdown. And we have, again, these restrictions of mobility. So this subsector of the care economy is, not um, recovering the way that we, we, we want, we wish for, for these women to return to labor market. Uh, I, I, I want to share with you the, 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 the dimensions that we are monitoring in, in our observatory. We are monitoring the initiatives for um, care services for the mobility due to care responsibilities. And I have to mention that, for example, Argentina was one of the countries that uh, design and implement this kind of permissions in order <coughs> to separate parents could move to um, take children from one house, from a, one house to, to, to the other in order to do not stay only with the mother or only with the father. And this was very important because uh, um, it, it's a measure that think and, and that promote corresponsibility between uh, separate parents. And of course, communication campaigns uh, on corresponsibility and the measures to pay domestic workers that of course you know that it's a very uh, informal sector in, in, in Latin America still. We have few exceptions like Uruguay, maybe Chile, where this sector is, is, has more formal or more uh, cover um, workers. But in, in, in the majority of the countries, the, the paid domestic workers are very disprotected and in a very um, bad conditions of work. I, I want to, to, to close my intervention with a very important point on uh, how to review the, the, the care economy not as a um, not an, as a standard of, of of public um public budget but as an investment as td mentioned and and we want to fulfill this uh, diagram with 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 figures with information about, for example, how many jobs we can create in a fair economy generating income for persons employed in the sector if we reactivate the economy, taking the care economy as one of the motor, one of the dynamic centers for the recovery. Um, this can increase consumption and have effects in the, in, in the global economy activity, 
generate or or fresh resources through tax taxation, or so to 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 fiscal incomes and invest in integrated policies and systems. Mexico has one of these studies calculating all this way of the virtual circle of the investment in car economy. And we are working from ECLAC with um, Chile, Uruguay, and maybe uh, Costa Rica in order to have these uh, figures for these other three countries. So in order to have evidence to support this uh, thing that we, we rise about care economy is not a expenditure, but is an uh, invest for the recovery of the economy. Um, well, we have a few examples of, of care system in the region. Uh, I will leave with you the, the presentation with all the links for the for the countries and the cities of the region, and uh, yes, I will um, stop here and continue with you in order to comment and share uh, after the others interventions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lucia, for that. I mean, it's such stark statistics on. Latin America, but of course we know that those stats um, and, and that gender gap and the regression and that we've seen for, for women um, in the care sector uh, is, is something that is the case um, in, in all regions of the world. Um, and, it, and, and that point about the disproportional impact of women also then means that in plans to so-called build back better or, or look ahead to how we recover, um, women have to put, be put on the forefront at the forefront of that and certainly you know looking at some of the budgets and investment plans that are coming out of countries right now you, we don't see that um, and again it's it's frustrating to, to for that to be um, overlooked for such a big part of the population to be overlooked in that way um, I'm going to come now to uh, Rachel 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 Muse who is from WeGo um, she is the Deputy Director of the Social Protection Program. And we'll talk about a very important aspect of, of this discussion and, and of care and, and women and gender, which is informal workers. So I'll hand over to Rachel. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Faiza. And thanks to uh, Chidi and Lucia for the comments so far. I think they've um, really set the, the, the tone and also the issues. Um, for the discussion. I'm going to focus more on um, informal workers within the care economy and also the care needs of informal workers, building on some of Lucia's analysis of domestic workers. So just as by way of introduction, for those who are um, not familiar with WeGo, WeGo is a, a global policy research and advocacy network that supports informal workers and their organizations to advance their labor rights and secure their livelihoods. Our membership includes workers within the urban informal economy from four occupational groups where women are likely to find employment um, in the global south. This includes domestic workers, home-based workers, street vendors and market traders and waste pickers. Work in these sectors is characterized by high levels of vulnerability and low earnings. So let me start with uh, some of the analysis that we are hearing from domestic workers about the, the way in which the pandemic has hit them. The situation of domestic workers during the, during the pandemic acutely highlights the paradox of the essential care worker. In some countries, domestic workers providing direct care services or working for other essential workers were categorized as essential workers themselves. This brings both visibility and recognition, but does not necessarily come with improved working conditions, access to social protection, health care, or personal protective equipment. In fact, it, it ended up forcing some domestic workers, even those who are high risk, such as older workers or those with comorbidities, to continue working, thereby putting their lives at risk. 
Uh, a regional survey of over 2,700 domestic workers in Latin America conducted by the International Domestic Workers Federation finds that across the 14 countries included, most did not have clear policies during lockdown periods on whether domestic workers are essential workers. And the lack of clarity led to worsening working conditions due to either more or fewer hours of work, changes in work modalities and arrangements, and increase in violence, mistreatment, and labor rights abuses. For instance, uh, live out domestic workers some were, were ended up living with their employers throughout the lockdown period to provide um, paid care work and gave up on their working hours and their privacy and were not compensated for the additional workloads that they had to carry. So many, in addition to that, as Lucia has mentioned, many domestic workers also lost their jobs during the pandemic. And the informality, the informal nature of domestic work across the world prevented many domestic workers from accessing emergency social insurance measures such as unemployment benefits, sick leave, or redundancy payments. The emergency cash and in-kind in transfers, which we saw, um, we saw sort of exponentially increase uh, with the start of the pandemic last March, um, they were set up to reach, some of them were explicitly set up to reach informal workers. And though coverage pa patterns varied across countries and regions, um, we saw that generally documented and undocumented migrants faced specific inclusions, exclusions, excuse me. And the IDF, IDWF study found that only 60% of domestic workers surveyed across Latin America received any kind of emergency relief, be that cash transfers or, or, or food relief. And that when they did receive relief, this was too little to meet the needs of their families. This finding in Latin America amongst domestic work workers corroborates our own research at WeGo in the first round of our COVID-19 and informal economy survey in 12 cities across Africa, the Americas, Asia, and Europe only 40% of respondents said that they were able to access emergency relief measures. The main barriers to access was that they were not aware of the relief or they were not eligible for the relief. And here informal workers organizations played an important role in linking their members to social protection schemes during the pandemic and helping them access digital interfaces. Many of them did not have smartphones or the digital literacy needed to apply online. Workers organizations also provided relief when the state did not, for instance, by distributing food packages and providing shelter to domestic workers who were facing violence at home during the lockdown. Emerging from this pandemic, domestic workers organizations are reiterating their demands prior to the, to the pandemic. So the ratification of ILO Convention 189 on domestic work and Convention 190 on violence and harassment improving compliance with existing legislation that protects, protects domestic workers and obliges employers to cover their social security contributions. But in addition to that, there are specific demands that are emerging out of the crisis. So clear health and safety protocols to reduce the risk of transmission, access to emergency relief and vaccines to all domestic workers, including undocumented migrant domestic workers, on which so many national care systems rely on. And we've seen shifts in some of, we've seen progress in, in 2020. So domestic workers organizing has led to some legal wins such as the ratification of C-189 and C-190 in Namibia and the ratification of C-189 in, in Mexico. In Peru, domestic workers pushed for a new decree mandating written contracts and pay slips for domestic workers. So these are uh, positive moves in a uh, rather in a very difficult context. But I also want to focus this discussion on the links between unpaid care work and paid work when we talk about it, women informal workers. There's been considerable focus across countries on the growing care responsibilities in the home, brought on not only by the lockdowns but particularly by the school closures. Um, much of the media attention has focused on the worrying trend of women leaving the labor market altogether to, to take up these additional care responsibilities, as Chidi's mentioned. 
And for most women informal workers, the response to growing care demands at home has cannot cannot always be, or is often not, to leave the labor market altogether. Their work is what puts food on the table. Um, as noted, many are not covered by social insurance schemes and their own family and community networks are strained due to the massive loss in earnings. So what we are seeing is rising pressure as women informal workers' resources, energy, and mental health is worn down by the pressures they face to earn an income alongside their growing unpaid care work responsibilities at home. And in our COVID-19 and informal economy survey, we found that those unpaid care work responsibilities, the key areas of increase were homeschooling and childcare. We didn't see yet the impact of uh, rising health needs within the household because the survey findings come from April and July of last year. Uh, we also saw that an increase in unpaid care work was due to indirect care, so mainly around uh, protective um, measures um, around hygiene and um, uh, just for informal workers who were working during the pandemic, when they would come home, there were a lot of activities around washing and sanitizing, et cetera, that took up a considerable amount of time. What we found that was that more women than men experienced an increase in their unpaid care work during the pandemic, knowing as the data Lucia showed is that women do more unpaid care work than men to begin with. And in July, women with more unpaid care work reported earning only 40 to 49% of their pre-pandemic earnings. They fare far worse than all other informal workers who were earning at least 60% of their previous earnings by this time. So another, another finding was that women and men informal workers who cited an increase in unpaid care work responsibilities were also more likely to draw down on their savings, take out loans, or sell their assets to meet their basic needs. So lower incomes now and in the future and higher levels of household debt point to growing food insecurity and greater exclusion from privatized care services, including healthcare and childcare services. We have a real life example that's happening in South Africa right now. The childcare sector is collapsing as childcare providers, many of whom are unregistered women informal workers catering to the needs of other women informal and informal workers in informal settlements and townships and low income neighborhoods Many of these women were not able to reopen their businesses or comply with the new COVID-19 hygiene measures. Their customers have lost their incomes too and can no longer afford to pay for childcare services. So women face the impossible choices between taking their children with them to work on city streets or markets amidst a public health um, crisis, leaving them at home unintended or in the care of an older sibling, and or finding more vulnerable, low paid and flexible employment within the informal economy, which may leave them with a bit more time uh, for childcare. We've seen the limits of privatized care services throughout this crisis, and sh it should lead to greater investments in public care services through economic recovery plans. However, this is not what is expected. Um, Surprisingly, a review by Eurodad of IMF loan arrangements signed last year finds that 72 countries are expected to meet fiscal consolidation targets by the end of this year. This is uh, reductions in um, public spending represent three quarters of the total adjustment measures and 40 countries are expected to make cuts during the period of their loan arrangement that are equivalent or greater than their current healthcare budgets. So this runs contrary to what the World Bank and the IMF are saying at the moment, which is to encourage public expenditure at this time. What this indicates is that austerity policies, which will be introduced this year, will delimit the ambition of national economic re recovery plans to invest in care services. So this will undermine attempts to expand public services by creating new decent work opportunities within the care sector, particularly for those who've lost their employment. We could have imagined, for instance, employment schemes that build on domestic workers' skills set to train them for new jobs in childcare or elder care services. But it will also thwart 
efforts to expand emergency relief and cash transfers that are still so desperately needed, particularly by women informal workers who are a much are much further away from recovering uh, their prior earnings um, than, than men or women in the informal economy without care responsibilities, or at least who've not noted an increase in their unpaid care responsibilities. So I'll leave it there, but of course, open to, to questions and clarification. Great, thank you so much for that, Rachel, and all very sobering. Um, there's a question that's been put here and something that's been I've been thinking about as well in hearing um, the three of you speak so far. So the question that's been put here is, um, for those that have ratified the ILO Domestic Workers Convention, number 189, um, what, what has that meant for obligations of the state for those countries that have got that? Um, has that meant, um, has that, because that recognized millions of domestic workers, uh, domestic workers as workers, has that further empowered them? Has that made a difference? Um, to have that convention in place. Um, and more generally, I, I guess there's a question of um, what, what are the blockers here to change? And I'm gonna bring in a moment, uh, Janet in from the Women's Budget Group in the UK has been doing, doing a lot of work on this. And um, why is it, even though it makes so much sense in terms of the economics, when you talk about investment, when you talk about the employment rate and GDP and the rest of it, what do you think the, the key blocks are here to change? Um, I'm going to come back to you, Rachel, just to, if you want to answer that question about the difference, because you mentioned it as well, uh, the difference that the ILO convention made where it was in place. Yeah, and, and Chidi, please come in. <laughs> um, so the... Um, for, for the countries that have ratified um, C189, there is an obligation, first of all, to recognize domestic workers as workers. And that's really critical because some countries still do not recognize domestic workers as workers, which means that they can't organize, they can't unionize, uh, they cannot be part of tripartite negotiations. Um, it also means that employers have a responsibility to register domestic workers, to provide written contracts, to ensure that domestic cover uh, social security contributions for domestic workers. Um, they also have rights to protection at work. Uh, so against violence and mistreatment and abuse at work, um, which is further strengthened through convention 190. So there, it is, it is a critical step towards moving domestic workers from the sort of informal economy towards the formal economy. Um, and and so it's not the only step, but it certainly provides the legal framework um, that is absolutely necessary for that process. And one of the one of the the findings from the International Domestic Workers Federation report uh, in Latin America is that though many of those many countries like Uruguay, um, Mexico, Chile, others have ratified C189, there's still a problem with compliance. So it's not, it's not just that you ratify C189 and these, these systems are set in place. You need the labor inspection that, that ensures that employers comply with providing uh, written contracts and um, making social security contributions to domestic workers. And, and in countries where even if there's not a ratification of C189, but there is legislation protecting domestic workers and recognizing them as workers, um, they, they would have had access, for instance, to social insurance, so unemployment benefits during the pandemic, or paid sick leave, or um, uh, redundancy payments, which many uh, domestic workers where that legislation does not exist or is not complied with did not have access to. So, um, but Chidi, please come in if there's more to add there. Chidi, if there's something to add on that, and in particular, I mean, I guess it would I guess this work is being collected right now, but the difference between where that convention is in place and where it isn't in place and how that sector fared, you know, to be able to compare in terms of um, the evidence and the difference that it made. Um, you know, in, like you said, in theory, it makes a big difference, but then compliance is a big issue. So did you, did you want to come in on this or just generally to talk about what the blocks are to change going forward? 
Um, thank you, Faiza. In fact, I think Rachel covered it quite comprehensively and, uh, and extremely well. Um, I would add to that that um, even in countries where the convention um, hasn't um, been ratified, it has um, propelled in some places and far too few places, but still in some places, changes to um, you know, national legislation and practice, and which have been vital to dealing with the, the fallout or the consequences of the pandemic, not only the health consequences, but of course the socioeconomic consequences. Um, so as um, Rachel mentioned, it's a tool, it's a necessary tool, but I mean, it's not a panacea. And um, even in, in places where the convention is ratified, and we've not necessarily seen um, the sorts of um, inclusive measures um, for the protection of um, domestic workers and other um, workers in the care sector who are in um, you know, vulnerable or precarious forms um, of employment. Um, but the underpinning of that legislative framework and then the enforcement mechanisms, again, as Rachel man, uh, mentioned, um, to ensure um, compliance um, are, are absolutely um, critical. Um, why no change? Um, I think you mentioned it in your opening. One of the reasons is again, you know, the, the dearth of um, women in leadership positions, including when it's come to um, decision making around uh, responses um, to the COVID um, pandemic. Um, I think right across the board, we have seen, um, you know, uh, all too often that the faces that are speaking to, to us are predominantly um, male faces. And when we look at what happened um, with some of the very necessary, um, you know, response measures to the pandemic, you, you wonder how would how might they have been different, um, you know, if women were involved um, from the outset. When you look at the um, obvious impact on just, for example, sexual health and reproductive, um, you know, services, um, because of course all of our services had to be geared towards coping with the pandemic. But these crucial services became you know, unavailable. And you think, well, maybe if there were women in decision-making positions, they may have found ways to ensure that this did not slip off the agenda with all the um, you know, related consequences to that. We saw the fact that, uh, you know, as you know, right at the, when it was the first wave of the pandemic, if I can put it that way, and we were all asked if we could to stay at home, you know, as Rachel has pointed out for many, um, people, those going out um, to work in our health and care services and um, informal economy workers. Um, it just wasn't possible to confine ourselves at home. But when we had to, we saw again this explosion in the numbers of um, you know, domestic violence cases um, right across the world, but without the availability of services um, to, to deal um, you know, um, with those impacts. Um, again, um, when you're looking at you know, what's needed um, for recovery, the investment and that we need and where that investment would go. Um, you can't help but wonder again, if we had more women in leadership positions, whether more focus and attention would be, be, pay, be being paid to um, investment in care. And I say all of this, not just thinking, okay, well, you know, just put women in positions of, of decision-making and everything will be solved. I mean, you know, you need women who will come to it with this um, lens of um, you know, what is required to engender this um, transformational um, or um, feminist approach. The specter of austerity, is, as Rachel mentioned, is, um, is looming large. And again, you know, it, you just think this is so, it seems, and I think it, it, it would seem to uh, most women, I hope anyway, that this is counterintuitive. That, you know, asking, um, you know, uh, and in fact, I think the IMF and the World Bank recognizes, which is exactly why, as Rachel says, on the one hand, their public message is that you need to spend, spend, spend at the moment, but already in many countries, they are telling governments that they need to cut back on their public expenditure, they need to engage in fiscal consolidation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and this is a real threat to um, our long-term recovery, not only our short-term or immediate-term recovery um, from this pandemic. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Chidi. And just the experience of austerity in the UK was absolutely, it was off the backs of women. And um, I'm going to bring Janet in from the Women's Budget Group, and they were very good at showing this. It wasn't just women, it was minority women that were most affected by austerity. And we, we know that that is, that is a pattern likely to be repeated. It doesn't, it, it, every time you show it, it doesn't seem to affect how uh, behavior changes. Before I bring you in, Janet, let me just bring in Lucia and Anantha. Thank you for your questions on here. And if anyone wants to 
ask more questions, please put it in the Q&A. Um, also pointing out that in Latin America, there has been a decline in female employment that has been steeper than it has been um, for men where there is data available. So do you wanna comment on that or come in on anything else in regards to, to the blockers of change? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I want to, to um, take the, the last intervention of Titi about this trade between uh, the fiscal effort in order to uh, do not exploit the debt of the countries, um, but also uh, the, the need and the urgence to invest and to really spend in the people that is vulnerable and the women's vulnerable to poverty and in risk to uh, lose the economic autonomy, losing the jobs are lo and losing the, the, the space in the, in the economy. So um, uh, of course we know this, 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 this tension, um, but we think that the consequence of not invest, not spend now in these, uh, in these women, in these uh, households, could be very um, uh, could be worse in the future uh, in order to this uh, amount of women re reinsert in the labor market or in the formal economy. We have a few proposals for, from ECLAC and one of them is, for example, uh, to include the domestic workers in the first line of the vaccination national plans in order to uh, assume that domestic workers and caregivers uh, are part of these essential uh, sectors as education and as health and are, as, we, uh, as Rachel mentioned, a sector um, with uh, very low um, percentage of social, social security, uh, health insurance. And if we give this signal that they are, these women are so important, so essential as the people from the health, the people in the sector of education, maybe we can visualize <coughs> the value and the importance for the well-being of the whole society, respecting their uh, rights as worker also. Thanks. Thank you, yeah, that's a great point in terms of vaccines and where we're prioritizing those. Um, we've been joined by Ian Golding too, who's a professor at the University of Oxford, who's gonna be speaking in a moment um, about how we compensate essential workers better in, um, what we do on the care economy. At this point, I just I wanted to bring in Janet Beach, who is the chair of the UK uh, Budget Committee, who I who I invited to really reflect on some of the comments that um, she's heard today and more about the work that they're doing in the Women's Budget Group. The Women's Budget Group has been uh, very critical in pointing out that not just the impacts and disproportional impacts of women um, on women and the importance of the care sector, but also making the point that when we talk about infrastructure investment, it, social infrastructure is just as important uh, as the bricks and water infrastructure. So I'll bring Janet in here, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, when you mentioned Pfizer, the work that we did with the Runnymede Trust on uh, looking at the impact of austerity on women and particularly on minoritized women, I started trying to find a slide to share with you uh, that kind of, that shows it visually the very enormous the impact the regressive impact but I can't find it but I will come back to that shortly. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. Really good to be here. Um, for years, for about ten years, I used to come to CSW and I really miss coming. Um, I think we all miss it. It would be so great to be in the room together now rather than doing it by Zoom. But on the other hand, this is a good, uh, we are at least able to do something this way. Um, 
In terms of what everyone said, this is really a familiar picture, isn't it? And I don't have much to add to it because you've said it all. Um, the, the issues that my group that I chair now, the UK Women's Budget Group, we've been working on this for a long time. Um, the aim of our work is to try and make visible some of the things that we've been talking about today, uh, the structural inequalities that women in particular suffer on from minoritized women more than most. Um, and we decided that we would run, um, a couple of years ago now, we decided we would run a commission on a gender equal economy. And the idea of running the commission was to be able to go out and ask people for evidence um, and take evidence from witnesses. And we were very fortunate in getting funding for this. Um, we looked at the things that we have been considering for years, which is really about the fact that women's unpaid and paid care work is the backbone of any economy, but it's invisible in state accounting systems. Um, and, you know, without the care economy, the mainstream economy um, couldn't run. So the labor force would not be reproduced. You know, you wouldn't get children being brought up, um, going to school, helped, um, supported into work. Uh, and then when you're in the labor force and you go off sick, it's usually a woman who will look after you. Um, if you need looking after, um, women look after the long-term sick and the disabled people, and of course the old people um, in, the, in the community. So all this work is being done, but it doesn't feature anywhere in state accounting systems. And that means that policy uh, makers don't really take it into account. It's not seen as something that matters or is important. Um, and we were really aware of this in the Women's Budget Group um, for a number of years. And what we wanted was to really take a good look at the whole issue um, and think about, okay, what does this mean for policy? What does this mean for what our budgets and our allocation of state funding? What does this mean for how our tax system should work? So how all our fiscal policy, um, tax and spend, how that should be influenced by the need to support a proper care economy and one in which the people who contribute are properly rewarded and they have proper workers' rights and so on. I completely agree. Um, I also do work in other countries on women's rights and I completely agree that the informal economy is a huge issue in many other countries, not so much in the UK, um, although those women who are there tend to be from migrant and minoritized communities. Um, and that's part of the whole inequality, um, the structural inequalities that are built into the UK economy as much as, as many others. Um, so what did we find in our commission? I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about that. Um, we actually went, uh, we came up with about eight conclusions and I won't go into all of them because I only have five minutes to talk. Um, but essentially what we wanted to do was re-envisage the, re the economy completely and put care at the centre of it. So put the care economy in the middle. Um, and part of the way we would do that would be by investing more in social infrastructure. Um, that's already been mentioned. Um, the, the, there's a difference in um, the amount of money that's invested by governments in social infrastructure and physical infrastructure. Physical infrastructure tends to be given um, more investment than social infrastructure. In fact, you might argue that in many countries, it's only in recent years, in maybe in recent decades, that people have started saying, okay, we really need to invest in the social infrastructure. And one of the things we wanted to see out of our care commission, one of our recommendations, was that the UK should adopt um, a universal care service, and this would be financed centrally by central government, and it would be connected to our national health service, which already runs a free at the point of use health service, which is available to almost everyone. Um, there are some exceptions for people who are 
not in the country who are have uncertain migration status, but otherwise it's available to everyone. And we wanted to see that as a way of restructuring our care sector and making sure that it was well trained and well paid. And at the moment, it's neither. And everyone loses from this, the women themselves, but also those people who are cared for. Um, the second thing we wanted was free universal childcare provision, including early childhood education and activities before and after school. So wrap around care to allow women to, to work um, as well as having children. Um, we wanted to increase the, again, the training that's provided for childcare workers um, and their qualifications and their pay. We also wanted to see increased investment in healthcare and stronger um, uh, representation and higher pay for nurses, healthcare assistants and other support staff. At the moment, they are right at the bottom of the ladder. And our government has just announced that it wants to restrict uh, the pay rise for uh, workers in our National Health Service to 1% this year, despite others getting higher uh, rates. And despite during the pandemic, the healthcare workers being praised as heroes, but this isn't, we find, translating into cash at the moment for them. We wanted to transform the worlds of paid and unpaid work. And by that, we mean we want to make it easier to combine paid work and caring and create equal legal entitlements equal sharing of parental leave in the first child's year of a child's life, that sort of thing. We wanted to cut the full-time working week to 30 hours and provide a guarantee that workers will always have enough hours to meet their income needs. And some of that would be underpinned by a minimum wage based on the real cost of living. We already have a national minimum wage in the UK, but it's widely seen as not meeting people's actual living needs. We made a number of other recommendations about how the social security system should be improved, how the tax system should be improved. Um, and we wanted to refocus, um, which I'll, I can say a bit more about later if people are interested in. We wanted to change the way in which our, um, the international economic and financial systems work. And this goes to this point of what is measured in the economy and what is invisible. Um, so we are very keen to see state accounting systems shift over to a model where some account is taken of the caring work that's done. And similarly, we we'll want a global trade system that recognizes the way in which um, it's already been mentioned, care workers and health workers are moving from the global south to the global north and what can be done about that. Um, we found that our commission landed in the middle of the pandemic um, and that I feel as I'm running out of time so I'm going to stop in a second but just to finish on this um, we found that we we landed in the middle of the pandemic and so we were very well received by all the political parties um, the political parties were having their conferences at the time we were invited to all of them to speak about what we'd found and we did some polling of the uh, public, um, which found very high rates of support for building a caring economy. So 68% of people saying that well-being should be used as the measure of success of an economic policy. Um, even more, 79% saying a better balance is now needed between paid work, caring responsibilities. Um, and a lot of agreement with the general idea that Economic equality between women and men is the mark of a good society. Social care should be able, available to everyone based on their need and not on their wealth. So we got a lot of um, support uh, from, the, uh, from both political parties and from, our, uh, from the public generally. How this will be taken forward um, is unclear at the moment, uh, but we hope that, uh, I mean, I can say more about what we think we might do to take it forward, um, but we hope that it will make an impression and that people will start to think a bit more deeply about the problem of, of caring and the fact that caring is simply 
uh, disadvantaged and disregarded in many um, economic uh, discussions at the moment. We want to change that and we hope that the Commission will have done gone some way to doing that. Thanks, Moza. Thank you so much for that. It's really helpful to get some insight on, on the ground, you know, building the work, making the demands, and a reminder that this isn't just about small tweaks, this is about transformational change and actually about a shift in values. And as others have said, if not now, if we can't get those values to shift now, then we're really gonna you know, miss this, this opportunity to push. And um, I wanna bring in Ian Goldin, who's the professor on globalization um, at the University of Oxford, who's gonna speak about essential workers in the care economy. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for joining us. I know that you rushed over from another Zoom call to join us, thank you. Thanks, uh, Faze, and apologies for not having um, been part of this conversation from earlier. Uh, but from the little I've heard, it's clear that many of the points that I, I thought of raising have already been expressed. Um, I don't need to tell this group how the pandemic has particularly discriminated against women um, and um, in all respects, in terms of job losses, uh, in terms of the, the new pressures of care, uh, in terms of being most likely to be in a vulnerable uh, situation in terms of COVID uh, and the high level of skewedness um, around the world uh, in terms of the impact on incomes and also mental health. So uh, it's really been devastating and it's set back progress on gender by uh, many decades as it has more broadly uh, on development, but particularly for women. And also, of course, it, the other groups like ethnic minorities, which have been particularly uh, discriminated against. And when ethnic and gender combine, uh, the results are particularly negative. So uh, it's um, an important and timely issue to be focused on. And one of the things that um, I've been doing together with Pathfinders is to think about how one could more fairly compensate um, essential workers and those that are putting themselves at risk uh, on all of our behalf, uh, whether it's in a hospital, whether it's in a care home, uh, whether it's in a supermarket uh, or wherever, people exposing themselves in ways uh, which are putting them at grave risk. Um, together with Sarah Cliff, uh, done some work looking at what possible models there are and how one may grapple with this. Uh, to date, the response has been extremely haphazard. Um, some companies have pe put people at greater risk, uh, um, and we've seen that um, the really irresponsible behavior of some companies. Some have made their own efforts uh, to try and protect their workers, um, but most have done very little and just followed government guidelines. And governments have also been haphazard. There are a few governments um, that have been innovative. For example, the Ghanaian government has uh, given tax exemption. Uh, to essential workers, uh, which is a, a really smart initiative. Um, it'll cost in the long term uh, because of tax revenues being lost, but it gives an immediate pay rise effectively uh, to, to people in the short term. Um, some other governments like the Canadians have given a little bit of a pay increase uh, to care workers, but others, not least embarrassingly, the UK government where, where I am, uh, have been shockingly uh, bad, insultingly so, um, and given a derisory pay increase. One of the, the things that we think um, could be useful is to think about how some other essential workers that take risk on our behalf are treated, and particularly look at whether there's a comparison with the military uh, who to take risks on behalf of society. Of course, most of the time military don't take risks, they sit in barracks, but are treated as if they, they take risks. Um, but we are prepared in some areas like the military to acknowledge danger pay. Uh, some firms give danger pay to people working in tough places or dangerous places, and that's appropriate, uh, but that doesn't apply to people doing the most dangerous work, which is um, in hospitals, in care homes, and others. 
And um, so the extension of that, and it can happen in various ways. One is, of course, to give people more pay, uh, but it's also by thinking about the consequences of ill health, so protection, or the, or the focus on protective gear in the military uh, is a major focus, of course, and has been the, the focus of scandals uh, when that gear has proved to be inadequate. Um, that needs to apply equally to PPE equipment, uh, to masks and other equipment for people in care homes. And um, the, uh, the, the allied question is what happens if you do um, get affected? So your medical care and of course, protection of your dependents uh, and others. Um, all part of a comprehensive package in the military where they are very generous sick pay, disability pay, um, life insurance, family benefits, if you are wounded or um, are killed uh, in action, or even in an accident, not in action, none of that applies in the health sector, for example, or to care workers. Um, that a asymmetry seems wrong, uh, not least because people in care and essential work are putting themselves at far greater risk now than people in the military. And it's one of the big ways in which society's priorities are skewed. Of course, pandemic prevention is an even deeper way and the amount of money we spend on a nuclear missile compared to um, uh, pandemic prevention, which reflects how topsy-turvy our risk analysis is at the, at the macro budget level, but it's also at the micro level of, of employment. And so um, Sarah and I in, in this op-ed in The Guardian, um, which you can look at for more details, propose this. It's just one, and it's certainly not uh, the biggest or other part of that, which you've been discussing, way of dealing with gender issues, because women are particularly disproportionately represented in these essential uh, services. But it's one that we hope will um, get traction and um, which um, uh, Faiza suggested I share with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Ian. It is a, a way in which to articulate the, the danger component um, and, and where people already un understand that in that comparison with the army. It did strike me listening to you about stories of um, migrant workers who died and then were told by governments, that their families were told by governments that they would have to leave, that their migration status was then undermined. And there was a huge push, I know, in the UK and the government was embarrassed into reversing that decision, but it really is extremely insulting and inhumane. Um, uh, but you know, all those sorts of issues have been shown up. Um, you know, also that more Filip Filipino nurses died in the UK than they died in the Philippines um, from COVID. Um, and that is, that is the strong female migrant workforce there, um, very, very shocking. Um, I just want to come back, just do a quick round. I'm going to give you a minute each. Um, just thinking, looking forward in this moment, a year since lockdown, in which actually the public is largely on side with various polls around the world show that people do want progressive change. They do want more investment in healthcare. They do want care workers and essential workers to be properly compensated. What do we do right now? What is, what is, if, if you could say that action, the focus, and it, you might want to talk about the focus of your organization, but is it, you know, building movements? Is it about organizing? Is it, is it about research? Is it about policy ideas? And um, one thing that I said um, this time last year, and unfortunately the International Women's Day was still, you know, lockdown, was that we need to use those moments to have a march for carers. Um, and focus in on making sure that we are raising that point, because I think not, not everyone can see how crucial care is to, bring, to bring in around, bringing about gender equality. If we um, solve the care issue, that will be a lot of heavy lifting to get in gender equality, and yet it doesn't get the attention it deserves even within um, kind of left circles or progressive circles. Um, I'm going to start with you, Chidi. What's what's the one thing you think we should be focusing on in this moment? Wow. Okay. One thing <laughs> that's uh, I, I wouldn't be able to narrow it down to one thing. It's all of the things you just mentioned there, Pfizer. I think also um, recognizing the political economy of care because that's a lot of what is behind all of this. It's about who um, makes the choices, where the political um, will is, 
Um, you know, it's not about evidence anymore. We have the evidence. We know what term, you know, investment um, in care means. I just mentioned, and absolutely what you were saying about mobilizing, about seizing this moment where attention is, of course, so much um, on these sectors and the will of, um, you know, large majorities of the population is behind them as well. So the Global Union Federations, along with WIGO and the International Domestic Workers Federations organize on the 29th of October each year, a global day of action. Um, so, you know, we're calling on everybody to participate in this, to put the needed pressure on, on those who are holding the purse strings um, to, um, to recognize that actually this is what people want and does have, you know, um, some political muscle behind it as well, this demand. Great, thanks, Chile, for that. Uh, Lucia, what would, what's the thing to focus on in Latin America? Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> we think that the role of the state is very important. Public policies are central in order to go through the crisis. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe it sounds <laughs> outdated, but the role of the state for uh, a solution and for uh, an organization with a solution together is um, really crucial. And we have to think about this trade that TD and I mentioned before, because government state um, uh, do not did not hesitate in the past to save, uh, for example, banks or big enterprises with the economical crisis. So they don't have to hesitate in order to save people now and to support the uh, sanitary humanity social crisis that all the humanity, all the world is facing. So I think reevaluate the place, the role of the of the state in the well-being of all the people in our countries and in the region. It's it's very important. Obviously, all the uh, individual um, thought, political approach. Uh, at this time, um, we think are useless, and we really need a more comprehensive um, way of through the crisis together. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, thanks. I, I'd um, just building off of those two points. I'd say that one of the learnings we're having at WeGo as well is engaging directly in policy spaces with providers. So um, for instance, in the early childhood development uh, policy space, there's often very little recognition that women who are parenting uh, in the global South are also workers and that they are women informal workers and trying to make those links between um, those within the childcare sector um, who often don't take a feminist or workers lens to care also consider what does it mean uh, to, to expand childcare services? What are the implications of expanding childcare services for informal workers? What does it mean? What does decent work look like for childcare providers? How do we rethink the models that have been promoted even within the ECD community for low cost, low and low cost and inevitably low quality childcare services. And that's just an example, but I think that actually engaging, um, you know, we can do the same thing with those who are providing elder care services. When we think about privatized healthcare or public healthcare services, making those links um, within the care sectors that are uh, deeply, they're, there, we're, we're working in silos a lot of the time um, and not considering these sectors uh, as spaces for the feminist movement to engage, as spaces for um, the trade union movement to engage. Um, and many of the policy discussions don't consider uh, workers and don't consider women's rights in their, in their discussions actually. Um, so I, I think uh, that's, that's a space for engagement that um, is certainly opening up for us and I think could 
is promising um, and you know mobilizing around the global day of action as Chidi's talked about expanding that to uh, policy space to po those in policy spaces in you know global child care the global ECD community or the global community around older older persons I think that's that would be a big first step great yeah we need to be in more spaces basically we need to make that make these points more spaces done it yeah, I, I completely agree with uh, what Rachel's just said about uh, women's voice. Um, as long as women are not in decision making roles, uh, they're not going to be their needs are not going to be taken into account. So I think that's the most important thing. I think local research is really useful in taking it forward. Um, so one of the ways in which the women's budget group in the UK has been successful is by working, uh, creating an alliance between uh, activists and academics, so you get the benefit of that research. Um, and that's available all over the place. I'm doing some work in Malaysia at the moment, and they've just calculated that if you took away all the barriers to women's engagement with um, economic activity with the labour market, the income per capita would, re would increase by 26%. Now, those are very impressive figures um, and the government should be taking notice of them, um, but they're not. And in the UK, um, we have loads of research like that, but the problem is that we're not part of the conversation. And I think we need to raise um, our voices and be in order to be heard more, get more women into parliament and into other decision-making areas. Great, thank you for that. Ian? one thing we should be focusing on in this moment implementing the decisions that you all have been that what you've been all been saying <laughs> great thank you ian and just to just to end on this and thank you so much for those that have joined us and we're gonna we've recorded this conversation we'll put it on youtube um we one i was reading a study the other day a polling of um male and female care work a lot like the, the issues that have been brought up but one thing that really struck me is that not only were women doing more care work and it increased more for women, but women were complaining less about it. So where men had some increase, men were complaining more about being stretched and women weren't. So one thing that I want to say is that we need to complain more. We need to kick up more of a fuss um, because we can't let this work go unnoticed. So thank you to our incredible speakers today. Um, it's been really great to listen to you um, and we really must use this moment in the various ways in which you've said. So thank you uh, and keep in touch um, and we'll be uh, putting this up. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.